Welcome to Heart of a Shepherd. Uh, we began our devotional today with a word of commendation. And that is, if you have been following me throughout our study of the book of Isaiah, uh, today's scripture reading is chapter 55 and 56, only 10 chapters to go. I know that prophecy can be challenging, and uh, perhaps uh, some have become weary of it. Nevertheless, it's good to study the Word of God cover to cover, especially chronologically as we're doing so. So thank you for being a part of Heart of a Shepherd. I know our devotional style is quite different uh, from maybe others that you might find uh, out there in cyberspace, but I do appreciate you following the heart of this pastor whose desire is to look at the scriptures in a very literal and truthful manner and communicate God's truth, not my own thoughts and ideas. Well, our scripture reading today, again, is Isaiah 55 and 56, and the title of the devotional is Seek the Lord Before It's Too Late. Now, we have considered Isaiah's prophetic portrait of the Messiah's rejection, suffering, and death in chapter 53, and then that was followed by the summons for Israel in chapter 54 to break forth into singing. Now, though Israel would be taken away and afflicted by Assyria, the Lord promised he would not forsake them. Now, while years of humiliation attended the captivity, the prophet wanted the people to remember the Lord was their God, Redeemer, and the Sovereign of the whole earth. Let's consider Isaiah 55. Here we begin with, in verse 1, a universal invitation. Now, Isaiah began with a glorious invitation to all people with these words, Ho, or literally, listen. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Well, the spiritually thirsty and the poor in this passage were invited to come to the Lord, but not with money. You see, the Lord's invitation for salvation is that which can be accepted. It is his free offering of salvation that was executed by his grace, and that is his unmerited favor. Now, the salvation offered to the thirsty and poor of Israel is offered here in verse 2 to all sinners on the same basis by God's grace and loving favor. Let me say this, salvation has never been about the law or by the law. Salvation has always been by God's grace, God's mercy, and God's favor. And so here we find again in Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 2 that truth that is portrayed, that is presented to us. Now, what did the Lord promise those who were spiritually thirsty? Well, in verse 3, he promised if they would come to him, their soul shall live. That is, he offered them life, eternal life. In fact, we read an everlasting covenant, a security in God's promises and mercy. And then I believe, as you continue to read, that the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the one in verse 4 that is given, quote, for a witness and a leader and commander to the people. And so we have this wonderful, gracious invitation to all, and then specifically in verse 5, a gracious invitation to Gentiles. Now, most of you listening to this or are following this uh, YouTube devotional, you are Gentiles. There might be some that are uh, Jews by faith. However, most of us are Gentiles, and if we're born again, we are born again by faith and were saved by grace in exactly the same way the invitation was extended to not only Israel, but to all Gentiles. And so notice with me verse 5, here we see revealed that the Messiah would come not only to redeem the Jews, but that he would call Gentile nations. Now, they're described in verse 5 as, not as, as um, a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee. And so these were non-Hebrews who were invited to come to the Messiah. And they consider in verses 6 through 9 an exhortation to seek and repent. 
And so beginning in Isaiah 55, verse 6 through 13, is one of the great invitations recorded in the scriptures. In verse 6 we read, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Now, repent, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And so we see that the first step of sincere repentance is for a sinner to forsake his way, that being the way of sin. Now we're reminded that it is not only sinful actions, but sinful thoughts that must be abandoned when a sinner turns to the Lord. And so with the promise that he will, quote, abundantly pardon those who repent, the Lord warned, quote, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Chapter 55 and verse 8. And so here we know then that the thoughts and the ways and the plans of God exceed our ability to grasp and understand. His mercy and grace are, verse 9, indescribable. Now, a closing thought for chapter 55 before we briefly look at chapter 56. I want you to consider the emphasis of the preeminence of the Word of God in the closing verses of Isaiah chapter 55. Now, as the earth depends upon um, rain and snow and cannot bloom and grow without them, so the heart of man needs the Word of God. And so the Lord promises, quote, So shall my word, my truth, my revelation, be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, or that is empty or ha having no effect, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Now, if you are a teacher, a preacher, or a Bible student, it is a wonderful thing to read that when a sinner's heart is tender and he receives the word of God, like the earth receives seed and rain, that God's word convicts and brings forth the fruit of repentance and redemption. Now, what a great encouragement then to any of us that have the privilege of teaching and preaching the Word of God, that God has promised that His Word will fulfill its purpose. It reminds me of Hebrews 4 and verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than to any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, following that presentation of the power of the Word of God, I invite you to consider briefly Isaiah 56, where it's recorded the duty of man and the mercy of God. And so let's begin with the question, what does it mean to seek the Lord? Well, those who seek the Lord will seek, guard, and keep the law and the commandments. Now to them the Lord promised, quote, my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed in verse one. Now such a man then is blessed and the meaning of that is happy, uh, a perpetual happiness that really isn't dependent upon one circumstance. So such a man is blessed and he quote, keepeth the Sabbath and he keepeth his hand from doing any evil. That is, keeping the Sabbath is a day of worship and rest. Now, the Sabbath and its adherence by the children of Israel was a sign of sanctification. By the way, in Exodus chapter 31, it was a sign of sanctification not only to the Jew, but also to the Gentile believers who became part of Israel. How did they become part of Israel? By faith. You see, they're described in this passage as sons of the stranger. They join themselves to the Lord to serve him to love and the name of the Lord. Isaiah 56, 3 and verse 6. And then consider with me the blessings of the Lord. And here we have this wonderful universal invitation beginning in verse 3 through 8. And so understanding that the heart of the compassion of the Lord for sinners and reflecting the great commission of the New Testament the invitation to come to the Lord was universal. And so the Lord assured believers that both, and I'm going to quote here, 
the son of the stranger, that is non-Hebrews, who come by faith to accept the God of the scriptures, the son of the stranger and the eunuch, a man that has been castrated or disfigured. Uh, both of those who would have really have not been loved and would have been rejected and treated vilely, and yet in God's grace, they are to have their place among his covenant people. And yet the inclusion among God's people was not without duty, for they were to, and I quote again, keep the Sabbath and take hold of God's covenant in verse 4. They were to join themselves to the Lord. Non-Hebrew believers were to serve the Lord, love his name, quote, be his servants, and keep the Sabbath, Sabbath from pollutant it. Now, some perhaps listening to this are Sabbath day observers. Others worship the Lord on Sunday. But the great sin, I think, of our day is how few of us give priority to worship the Lord. And I hope that you do that. Now, we also notice that none who came to the Lord by faith would be turned away. Now, they could come to Zion, we read, which is called the Holy Mountain, and they could offer sacrifices and worship there. Why? Because the temple would be called a house of prayer, verse 7, for all people. What a wonderful truth this is, that God's invitation to the world is a universal invitation to those who would come and seek him. Isaiah promised that the Lord would not only gather the outcast of Israel, and that is those who had been spread by way of captivity, but that he would also, in verse 8, gather others to him. But then we have to close with a sad commentary, <clears throat> and that is the failure of Israel's leaders, verses 9 through 12. You see, Isaiah prophesied that hostile nations, described as in this passage in verse 9, hostile nations as the beast of the field or the beast in the forest, that they would come and they would attack Judah. And so the nation's spiritual leaders, we read, though, had failed to warn the people. We read the Lord's watchmen, literally his prophets and his priests, were spiritually blind in verse 10. They lacked discernment and they were lazy. In fact, those spiritual leaders had become like, quote, greedy dogs selfish and looking to their own way, their own pleasures. Well, a closing thought today. Reminiscent of many unfaithful pastors in our day, the shepherds, and that is the spiritual teachers of Israel and Judah, were foolish. In verse 11, we find they were self-serving. In verse 12, we find they were drunk and vain. And rather than warn the nation, which was their responsibility, about the consequences of breaking their covenant with the Lord, they actually convinced the people, ah, every day will be the same. In other words, nothing to worry about. Well, tragically, they had failed to warn the people that the judgment of the Lord, verse 12, was imminent. Well, I'm afraid there are many pastors in my day that are doing the same thing. They're comforting the people with a little tidbits of truth and and neglecting the whole. It's a heavy responsibility to preach the judgment of God, but it is necessary. Otherwise, how will sinners know to turn away from their sin and turn to the Lord? How will a sinner know that he's in need of God's grace if he doesn't realize his own wickedness? Well, I pray that this has been a challenge to you what a wonderful truth we've learned, the universal imitation of the Lord God of heaven, who is holy, to all who will come and seek him. I trust if you do not know him as Savior, that you'll make that decision today. To seek the Lord before it's too late. God bless you and bye-bye.